Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, where we dive deep into regional headlines and speak with leading policymakers and business leaders. I am Katie Jensen. As world leaders arrive in Davos, Switzerland, for the annual World Economic Forum, we speak with His Excellency Faisal Al Ibrahim, Saudi Arabia's Minister of Economy and Planning, to ask what the kingdom's main objectives are for participating at the global summit. Plus, how will Saudi be spending its oil surplus this year? And what are the top challenges in attracting more foreign investment into the kingdom? Your Excellency, thank you for joining us today on Frankly Speaking. Now, you are traveling to Davos to participate in the annual World Economic Forum as global leaders come together and try and solve the world's biggest issues today. Now, what is Saudi Arabia's main message at the annual summit this year? And frankly speaking, given all of the problems in the world today and all of the competition, why do you think anyone should listen? Thank you very much, Katie. It's, uh, it's clear that Saudi Arabia has always prioritized engaging with the global community. This year, we're there to cooperate, collaborate, and connect with the global community. Saudi Arabia has had a, a, uh, one of the most uh, uh, ambitious transformations in recent human history in the past seven years. And there's a lot that we can contribute, but also there's a lot that we can gain and benefit from being there, keeping our finger on the pulse of all global issues that may impact our transformation or ones that our transformation can contribute to. So this is in line with, uh, with the, our DNA and our history of continuously engaging meaningfully with the international community to resolve global issues, but also to give our transformation uh, all the tools and resources it's ne it needs to succeed. And certainly you enjoyed a very successful Saudi participation at Davos last year. This year you are returning with an even larger delegation as well. So tell me, what were the biggest lessons that you learnt at the summit last year? And what does your idea of success look like for Saudi Arabia at Davos 2023? For sure, Katie, one of the most important things is engaging and continuously engaging with our partners, but also establishing new partnerships. So not only strengthening our partnerships, establishing new ones and continuing the dialogue, keeping the doors open, keeping the dialogue uh, active is always beneficial, not only for us, but also for our partners. Saudi Arabia is undergoing a massive transformation, as we said. There's a lot of successes in the last seven years, and there's a lot of areas uh, that we can share uh, some lessons learned and data as well with regards to our transformation. A lot of the challenges uh, our global partners are seeing or will see are ones that we have seen or will see in the future. So there's a lot of value in sharing our story uh, and what we've learned. What we can say we have learned from the previous uh, participation is that there is a lot of value from engagement and we're focusing not only on engagement but also on the concrete steps that come out of it and the clear uh, actionable plans that come out of it and the ones that we maintain uh, uh, in every engagement. Well, I'm interested to hear you say you are certainly looking at new partners because I think many, of course, view uh, Davos as an opportunity for networking, but also a shopping opportunity, particularly when we talk about investments. And I think many people are certainly very interested in Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, but we haven't seen such as keen an interest in actually investing in Saudi Arabia itself. So why do you think that is? And what are you at the Ministry and other government departments doing to address some of these potential concerns or challenges? Without a doubt, Saudi Arabia has demonstrated that it is the global growth story. And in the past seven years, we've witnessed not only uh, commitment uh, to this transformation, but also delivery on this transformation. And, and in, in that regard, uh, more than 750 legislative reforms were enacted in order to in improve our business environment. We acknowledge the importance of institutional clarity, specifically policy predictability, and an institutional environment that will invite investors. Saudi Arabia will not move from here to here without a very serious uh, commitment to its transformation 
and the participation of partners, partners that we already have and new partners that are interested in joining uh, this uh, 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 movement or this uh, transformation. Uh, in addition to that, FDI has improved between 2020 and 2021 by almost 250 percent, if not more. The economy of the kingdom is poised to growth at 8.5 uh, percent, and we project even uh, a healthy uh, growth despite the challenges uh, over uh, 2023. Our non-oil growth activities have grown in, in the highest in, in the last 11 years, and, and there are m m many more pieces of evidence that show that Saudi Arabia is an attractive uh, investment uh, uh, location for current partners, but also future ones as well. Well, you talk there about the importance of bringing predictability to the market, transparency as well, and there is no denying Saudi Arabia's economy is booming. But in terms of some of the challenges in bringing more FDI to the kingdom today, what do you see as the top challenges and what are you doing to address them? Well, as we've said, uh, uh, Katie, investors seek policy predictability and an institutional environment. And the last seven years have seen more clarity and more transparency in terms of the data, but also in terms of what we're planning to do as policies to help uh, grow the economy sustainably and inclusively. On top of that, the 750 reforms that we mentioned, these are not coming out of the blue. These are coming out of engagement with our constituents in the private sector and the international investment community. So we listen to some of the challenges that they face, and naturally any rapid and massive transformation, with Saudi Arabia being the global growth story today, comes with some uh, challenges that need to be ironed out in partnership and collaboration. We have a very uh, unique platform through which we engage and listen to the private sector and the international investment community and to entrepreneurs and to SMEs and all constituents to make sure that the economy will help them unlock their potential as well. Well, you talk about opening up the conversation with uh, the international community. Tell me, who are some of the companies that you would like to see expand into Saudi Arabia? Of course, recently we've seen huge success with Lucid Motors. There's been talk about someone like McLaren potentially relocating its uh, regional headquarters to the kingdom as well. What are the big names that you would like to see in Saudi Arabia? And what are you doing to encourage them to, uh, to consider the kingdom? Anyone who has a long-term commitment to creating and co-creating value in the kingdom is welcome. We are keen on inviting everyone, uh, every type of company in the sectors that we're creating, but also the sectors that we need more long-term capital in. As you know, our biggest challenge is diversifying our sources of growth, so we are attracting a lot of investors in that regard. We recently launched our uh, uh, in national industrial strategy that's going to focus on attracting also more investors in specific sectors that will help us uh, export more uh, competitively, regionally and globally. So anyone who can help us in that uh, is more than welcome. Well, speaking of bringing some big international names to the region, in May last year on this program, uh, we spoke with the president of the World Economic Forum, Mr. Borg de Brent. Now, he alluded to the fact that should the summit decide to host its regional World Economic Forum in the Middle East this year, that Saudi Arabia would be the natural choice. So tell me about this. What discussions have been going on? How close are we to seeing a regional WEF summit in the kingdom? Well, we manage the relationship with the World Economic Forum on behalf of the government, and we have a clear agenda of our partnership opportunities. And one of them is actually exploring a very focused uh, fora in the kingdom that will be kingdom-based that will tackle some of uh, the global challenges. We are starting uh, with one on a, an experimental basis in Davos, and we'll take it from there. On top of that, we've been engaging more with the various initiatives that are championed by the World Economic Forum, and we are discussing uh, launching new ones as well, as you might see in the near future. So the conversations are obviously going on. The discussions are taking place. How close are we, though, to seeing a World Economic Forum in the region, in the kingdom, say, over the next 12 months? You will definitely see a lot of engagement and a lot of partnerships between the Kingdom and the World Economic Forum. We have the Center for uh, the Fourth Industrial Revolution. We have a few other centers that were also uh, announced and launched. 
and we will continue continuously be updating you, Katie, as things progress. Well, no timeline yet, but I am going to hold you to that. I hope you do join us on the show uh, to update us. It certainly has been a very busy year for you and an incredible one looking ahead because, of course, Saudi's economy is set to overtake India as the world's fastest growing major economy in 2023. Now, it is expected to invest heavily, as you've suggested, in further diversifying the economy. So tell me, what are the top sectors you're expecting to drive this growth forward and what are you at the ministry doing to support that? Well, we have two groups of sectors, if you will. We have sectors that are cre almost created from scratch. We have sports, entertainment, uh, uh, culture and tourism. And these sectors will attract the right kind of quality of life, but also the right kind of talent that we need uh, in the kingdom. Not only that, there's a massive focus on innovation in these sectors. So not only will they be sectors that create jobs that are traditional, but also innovative and that will leverage the energy of the youth as well. We have other sectors in the industrial side, mainly in mining and other uh, advanced manufacturing uh, uh, sectors that we want to focus on and want to establish more. Of course, we can't dismiss the, the innovative and creative uh, sectors that we also want to focus on. In the end, anything that can help us uh, diversify our uh, export portfolio so it is more competitive and more uh, 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 diversified and more complex is something we will do. So the sectors that will attract the right talent but also the right long-term capital uh, and help us uh, enhance our export diversification is what we'll focus on as well. Well, certainly some huge economic uh, opportunities in the year ahead. Now, last year, you spoke with some of my colleagues at the World Economic Forum in Davos back in May. And it was interesting. You explained that the surplus uh, received from oil revenues was going to be used at building Saudi Arabia's resilience, specifically paying off debts, replenishing reserves and helping to really accelerate some of these huge transformational projects. So tell me, what has been been achieved so far? What kind of progress have we seen? Well, we've invested a lot in, in, in the sectors and the sector strategies. We've also caught up on some of the areas that were a bit affected by the COVID-19 slowdown, despite performing very well uh, during COVID. And we're doing well in terms of our fiscal management and liquidity management. So overall, uh, plans are moving uh, according to what they, they were set out to achieve in that regard. What would you still like to see happen? You spoke about some of the sectors that have been affected by the pandemic. Talk me through the details of that. What are some parts of the economy that are still recovering and what are you doing to try and help turn that around? I noticed uh, in recent days, you've obviously changed some of the rules in terms of the Hajj pilgrimage. We're expecting a, a welcome boost for tourism there. But when it comes to the economy, what are some of the sectors that you're still trying to stimulate? So I think on the Hajj announcement, that's one of the last things that we wanted to do. And we're achieving uh, uh, the pre-COVID uh, numbers. That was the main area. Of course, the areas of Mecca and Medina and the economies there will benefit a lot from this uh, decision. Other than that, we believe that the economy has bounced back, as you can see from the numbers. Definitely, we would love to see more investments in the sectors that will help us export more competitively, more uh, uh, job creation, especially as we have a very young uh, population that is below 30, 30, uh, 60% of which is below the age of 30. So even in the media and the creative arts, there is a lot of opportunity there. But in general, the sectors that we mentioned, we'd love to see more investments there and more growth uh, in that area. Ultimately, Katie, we want to diversify our sources of growth. So exports and their diversification and their complexity and their competitiveness is what we're driving at. Well, certainly, despite some of the strong uh, economic numbers we've seen recently in Saudi Arabia, sometimes the kingdom does get a little bit of international criticism from the press, particularly, I think, one major criticism that the international media tends to fixate on is the fact that Saudi Arabia's vision does tend to be overly ambitious, particularly when we look at some of these massive giga projects. How do you respond to these kind of doubts? The reality is we're very serious about this transformation. Um, and, and there are a lot of pieces of evidence, a lot of examples that showcase that. One is the cultural or social transformation. I'm pretty sure you visited, Katie, and you've witnessed that there is a, a massive transformation in that regard. Cultural transformation or social transformation, something that in the past was seen 
as a hopeful byproduct of economic development is now seen as a necessary ingredient to it. And this is something that's championed by the leadership and the people. And this, is, this is evidence that this transformation is serious. We really believe in the strong upside of this transformation story, as you can see from the numbers and the successes in the recent uh, years. Of course, there will be criticism, but in the end, people need to keep in mind that this is something that was never attempted before, but we're very confident that it will uh, succeed. Another reason is because the government is open and discussing all aspects of its progress and its ambitions and its plans with all stakeholders, be it in the private sector, in the investment community, or in the uh, uh, NGO community. So we are open, we're discussing, uh, we're, 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 we're debating, and we're, going, uh, mo we're moving steadfastly uh, forward. In the end, the Saudi economy is a long-term, reliable partner for anyone who wants to invest in it. And I think long term there is key. But uh, some of these projects are hugely ambitious, set to take several decades. So when we look at some of these projects, do you feel so far that the timelines are accurate? Do you think we might see some adjustments in future years in order to make them achievable? From the perspective of the Ministry of Economy and Planning, what do you see as some of the potential changes? Or do you feel that the progress is 100% on track where we stand today? Most of these projects, uh, uh, Katie, are, are projects that are there to anchor the growth of sectors uh, or, or to crowd in more private sector investments into them. They're very much a very calculated, ambitious, but very calculated approach. Naturally, as projects go into development, there is a continuous uh, a pro a progress and there is a continuous assessment of things that need to change. Despite that, we feel 100% sure that these timelines are achievable. Some of these projects are more ambitious than others, and we're very bullish on achieving them. And, and you'll see that they will have a trickle-down effect on many areas. These are not just real estate projects. These are projects that will help us address our economic productivity uh, challenges and contribute to them. Some of them will have a trickle-down effect on global challenges and innovation opportunities globally and are attracting uh, the top thinkers and top researchers and top developers on many uh, uh, topics and many fields. If there was a single mega project you were able to identify, which one would you see as having the greatest potential to be able to transform Saudi Arabia and the international image of Saudi Arabia? I think everything we are doing today will have an, an impact on our image. But we're doing this, we're doing all of this. We should be mindful of the fact that we're doing all of this for the people of Saudi Arabia. Everything that's being done is to achieve a diversified economy uh, and also for us to uh, uh, address the young population that is growing into uh, a very vibrant economy, but also building state capability that will help us push out the right quality of, of policies and revise them and continuously engage with regards to them for the people of Saudi Arabia. Uh, we're, we're bullish about all of these projects and their potential impact on the economy and society. Well, let's talk a little bit more specifically about your role in this economic diversification. You've devoted your career to unlocking Saudi Arabia's economic potential. So as the Minister of Economy and the Minister of Planning, tell me a little bit about the structure of the ministry and some of the challenges that you face. So uh, the main challenges we face today are ones related to economic diversification. That's the first one. As we mentioned, we need to diversify our sources of growth. We have done great in terms of increasing uh, and the pace at which our non-oil activities are increasing, but there's still more room to grow in that regard to the point where we can export a more diversified and more complex portfolio of exports that are competitive uh, regionally and globally. Uh, the second challenge slash opportunity is that we have a very young population. Today we're very lucky, we're not an aging society, but 60% uh, of our population are under the age of 30. At some point we will grow and at some point we need to make sure that with that growth we capture what experts call the demographic dividend, is which, which is the value that will be created by the Saudis and the people living in Saudi Arabia as they enter the working age and as they enter the labor market. The third one is related to our state capability or institutional capabilities. We have grown a lot in the last seven years, but we're adamant that over the next eight to 10 before 2030, that the institutional capabilities of our 
uh, government, especially on the economic and development side, reach a point where they are competitive and they are the global standard, especially because that has a huge impact on our uh, quality of our policies and how fast and smartly we respond uh, to the changes around us. We've demonstrated success in that regard, especially during COVID-19, but obviously we're very ambitious to achieve even more. Ultimately, the ministry's role is to play a big uh, role and central role in facilitating uh, a lot of that. Everything from uh, supporting the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals to supporting regional growth and regional planning to many other areas and policy debates that the ministry is playing a leading and co-leading role in. Well, certainly some huge projects to be able to manage there. Now, finally, today, I wanted to be able to ask you, there was a fascinating video that was widely circulated a few years ago of Crown Prince Mohammed. Now, he said a few years ago that he sees Saudi Arabia and indeed the Middle East as becoming the new Europe. So can I ask you, how much do you think has been achieved of this vision so far? And how do you think Saudi Arabia is faring economically when we compare it to other first world countries? Well, the kingdom has clearly demonstrated a, a strong economic performance over the last years, especially the last year as we approach uh, achieving 8.5 percent or so uh, growth this year. If you even double click on that, you'll see that non-oil activities, as we have mentioned, have grown faster than ever before in the last decade. If you look at our uh, unemployment numbers, uh, they've been uh, the lowest in the last 20 years and in Saudi male uh, numbers, they're, they're the lowest ever recorded. Uh, on top of that, female labor participation rates uh, have increased to 37% from a base of 16 or 17%, surpassing our target in 2030. Uh, a, a lot of other uh, uh, numbers that demonstrate our progress, 40 to 50% of entrepreneurs today and SME uh, CEOs are women. So there is a lot of uh, success, but we're also conscious of the fact that there's a lot that needs to be done. And we're very transparent about our performance, and we're very adamant to achieve it in collaboration with the private sector uh, and the NGO community moving forward. And we're open to inviting all uh, investors from all around the world to invest in this a unique growth story. Uh, uh, ultimately, the kingdom is, is very serious about its transformation. This transformation is designed to impact the well-being of the people, but obviously it will have a trickle-down effect, not only on the region, but on the world. And we can see that. The kingdom is prioritizing regional economic integration and c uh, c contributing to uh, a lot of the global challenges, as we've seen in recent G20 uh, summits uh, uh, and other multilateral discussions. Well, certainly some huge potential in the year ahead. Your Excellency Faisal Al-Ibrahim, the Minister of Economy and Planning for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, thank you very much for joining us today on Frankly Speaking. We appreciate it. Thank you very much, Katie. Appreciate it.